This video is going to go through reference frames and relative motion. These two topics are really intertwined, so we're going to somewhat be doing them together, though I think I can break this video into at least two parts. So there are two major learning outcomes that it connects to. The first is communication, that when we're talking about reference frames, things can get really confusing because we're frequently talking about more than one reference frame which might refer to two or three different objects. And so it's important that we understand what we mean when we're talking about reference frames and that we have a notation that everyone agrees upon. And in particular, our notation is going to now involve multiple subscripts. But if you understand how to interpret those subscripts, this is actually going to be much clearer than if we didn't have an agreed upon notation. The second aspect is going to be problem solving. And there's kind of two aspects to this. One is just the specific calculation of how do you shift from one reference frame to another. The second aspect is going to be where we actually apply this. That relative motion and reference frames are not things that you're going to be told that you must use in a problem. However, deployment of these techniques is what makes many problems much simpler. So for instance, if you're doing a problem where an object is moving through wind or moving through, for instance, a river, you need to be able to use these techniques. Similarly, later on in physics, we're going to be seeing situations where we need to use this. In particular, with uh, momentum and collisions, it really helps to actually shift reference frames. And in Physics 203, we'll do a little bit of uh, reference framework when we talk about electric and magnetic fields. And that's, again, another place where we need to be able to do this. And then if you happen to continue on in physics, if you're looking at majoring or minoring, when you get to relativity in modern physics, this all comes back. So it might seem like a fairly tricky topic right now. We're mostly going to talk about it on the conceptual level because later on you'll need to be deploying it more than just right now. So there's a couple of questions that I've put into these videos because this again might seem like a tricky topic, but hopefully you have a reasonably good intuition for it. So I want you to think about this situation and thinking about this situation in particular will help set the frame of why we're talking about relative motion and reference frames. So imagine that you are on a plane that is traveling fairly quickly, airplanes go fast, at a constant speed and in the uh, dimensions or the directions of our page here to the right. So we're on a plane moving fast at a constant speed to the right. Which of the following 2D vectors, so effectively each one of these represents velocity vector as a function of time, would represent the uh, velocity vector of, again, as a function of time, of a ball that has been dropped on the plane? So again, the ball is dropped by a person on the plane. We are asking, what does it look like on the plane? And for this, you can, of course, be a person on the plane. So pause the video if you want and think through it. Again, I've given you three options. Which of these is the best, again, representation of velocity vectors as a function of time? OK. Again, pause the video if you haven't had time to think through this on your own. And the answer here is A, that when you're on the airplane traveling at a constant speed and you drop the ball, you just see it accelerate downwards. You don't actually see it move to the back of the plane. The ball drops down. And if you've actually been on an airplane before, this should make a lot of sense that as you're sitting there on the airplane and if the person in front of you, for instance, was to drop something, it doesn't suddenly zoom down the aisle of the plane. It just pretty much falls. Where that isn't true is if the plane is accelerating or slowing down, right? If the plane is taking off or landing, that's not the case. But if you're in the air and it's traveling at a constant speed, you really don't feel how fast the plane is going. So let's talk about this in great detail. So let's say that you're on the plane. And, and now just to make this make much more sense, we're going to imagine a transparent plane. And if you don't know, this is actually from Wonder Woman, the old television show. And she, in fact, had an invisible airplane. So that's the situation that we're going to think about. 
So if Wonder Woman drops a ball on in her invisible airplane, which is flying at a constant speed, she will see it accelerate downwards just as if we were standing on the ground thinking about something that wasn't moving. So what's important about this is that as we talk about reference frames and the airplane traveling at a constant speed is a good reference frame, the laws of physics are the same. We still have an acceleration downwards due to gravity. And so this is the key idea of reference frames, that the laws of physics still hold true in every single reference frame. Now, later on, we'll talk a little bit about why reference frames aren't necessarily special. But for right now, we're just saying that the plane is a good reference frame. She sees the ball accelerate downwards. It seems like physics still works. But now let's say that you're up on a mountain, right? that you are not on the airplane, that you look over and you see Wonder Woman doing physics experiments in her invisible airplane. What you see is the ball initially is traveling to the right, moving at the same velocity vector as the airplane itself. She's holding the ball. Then she drops the ball and you now see it move in projectile motion. Now, this y component here of the velocity is actually going to be due to gravity. So the y component velocity vector, you and Wonder Woman agree on that. But you see the ball traveling to the side with the same velocity as the plane, so that your total velocity vector is different. And she would see it only as having a y component. So again, all that projectile motion is, is free fall with a uniform motion in the x direction. So Wonder Woman sees free fall, you see projectile motion, because she sees it not having an x component, and you do. But you agree on what the acceleration due to gravity is. You also agree that there's no acceleration in the x direction. She, of course, doesn't see it moving in the x direction at all, the ball, with respect to her. You see it having a constant speed in the x direction. So within a reference frame, everyone agrees on what the accelerations are. And later on, this relates to forces. Everyone will agree on what the forces are. However, you might not agree on what the velocities are. So that's kind of one of the important takeaways here. So, okay. Now what? Now let's think a little bit about reference frames and define some rules. Reference frames, and especially what these are called inertial reference frames, the only type of reference frames that we're dealing with at this level of physics, they need to be moving at a constant velocity. Now, zero is in fact a constant velocity, and the idea is here that there's not any way of absolutely defining zero. We can define zero with respect to the ground, or we could define zero with respect to the sun or the center of our Milky Way but they need to be moving at a constant velocity. Now, all of the laws of the physics will be the same, and this is almost a consequence of the idea of reference frames. So, for instance, everyone must agree on the change in velocity due to an acceleration, but we don't necessarily agree on the absolute value, the, the magnitude of the velocity itself. And when we're working with reference frames, we need to start taking into account relative velocity because we can have more than one reference frame. And that's what we'll be working on in the second video that's part of this section. Okay, so now let's try to think through this a little bit. Which of the following might you consider to be the best inertial reference frame? Driving in a car down the road at 29 meters per second, riding in an airplane at 250 meters per second, standing still on the surface of the Earth, or being, for instance, on an asteroid in space at 2.5 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Again, pause the video and think about this. Which is going to be the best inertial reference frame? Okay, hopefully you have your decision. The answer is actually D, and let me talk through this a little bit. So imagine driving in a car at 29 meters per second. <coughs> now, in general, roads are not perfectly smooth. You are bouncing up and down a little bit. So imagine that you're holding a glass of water. Now, normally, if I just sat my glass of water on a hard surface, like the surface of my desk, I would expect it to just be nice and perfectly flat. 
Now, in a car, you might hit a bump that makes the water sploosh out, or it might suddenly tilt, or it might have some vibrations on the surface. So that shows you that driving in a car isn't a perfect inertial reference frame, but it's pretty good. So for most physics situations, we would consider driving in a car at a constant velocity to be an inertial reference frame. But in doing so, we're ignoring all those little bumps and small turns, those small speeds up and slows down. We're simplifying it. Similarly with an airplane, certainly there's a lot of turbulence on many airplane rides, but when we consider an airplane, like I did with Wonder Woman's Invisible Plane, to be an inertial reference frame, I'm ignoring all of those little speeds ups and slows downs, those little bumps. Now standing still on the earth might seem like a really good reference frame. After all, you're still. This is almost a trick question in that the earth is rotating and a rotating object is actually not an inertial reference frame. However, we almost always ignore this. And so this is just a simplification we're really always making in our physics problems, except that I will have you do some physics problems in this class where you explicitly think about the rotation of the Earth. And it is possible to experimentally measure the fact that the Earth is turning, which means you're not in an inertial reference frame. So I would argue here that the best inertial reference frame is actually being on an asteroid that's traveling in space. Since it's in space, you don't have any turbulence, and maybe it's orbiting a sun, but the amounts that it's rotating, the difference between a straight trajectory and whatever orbits it's on, is actually much smaller than being on the Earth. So potentially being on the asteroid in space is the best reference frame, even though we would say it's going really fast. If you were on that asteroid, you wouldn't feel that at all. I want to briefly talk you through thinking about this reference frame situation. And in this case, we will be going into space for this. And since I can't actually transport you into space, we're going to use Yoda, who of course does live in space. And initially, Yoda is on an asteroid and he sees two rocket ships coming towards him, and they each have velocity v. Now, there are different velocities, and one thing that I've done here in particular, this velocity here on the left is explicitly to the right, so this is a positive x-hat direction. Now, the velocity on the right is going to the left, so this is explicitly in the negative direction, so that's why I put the minus sign out front, so that's meaning left, but why I've said the magnitude. So the velocity vector itself would have a minus sign hiding in it. So I wrote it this way to just make it really clear that this is a velocity to the left. Okay. So now what if instead Yoda was on this rocket ship that was traveling here to the right? What would that look like? So now, now we're still in Yoda's reference frame. And note that this rocket on the left, we would say here that V equals zero, because Yoda doesn't see that his rocket's moving. He feels like he's sitting still. But now this asteroid is zooming towards the rocket. And note that what we've done from here to there is add a minus sign, because now instead of pointing to the right, this asteroid is now going to the left. And this rocket ship that before was heading to the left now has a much larger magnitude velocity. And again, you see that both of these are negative. And so effectively, we're adding two vectors. We're adding their magnitudes, but it's pointing to the left. So I've just tried to bring out these minus signs explicitly. So that's what's happening here. And hopefully this makes sense. When you're sitting in a car on the expressway that's traveling at, say, 70 miles per hour, the cars next to you that are also traveling at 70 miles per hour, they look like they're sitting still. But the oncoming traffic looks like it's going very, very fast. So that's what's going on here.